Hello everyone. Welcome again to the Gehenna Bibliotheca. Summer draws to an end, and with that, we start heading once again into the fall season. But before we jump into fall and the much beloved Halloween season, we would like to give this summer one last collection of stories to close it out. One of the classic summertime activities is spending time out in the forest. Whether it's taking a hike, backpacking, camping, or hunting and fishing. But as beautiful and peaceful as they may be, they are still pockets of wild and untamed spaces. And in these spaces, the unknown and forgotten horrors have taken shelter there. One of the classic stories we often hear growing up is about friendly spirits that live there. Referred to as fair folk, pixies, fairies, and gnomes. If we dig into the original stories about them, we find they have a much darker side. And that these stories are not simply about friendly forest spirits, but warning about the possible fate that can fall on us for trespassing where we don't belong. Much like the warning in our first story tonight, where a police detective is trying to solve a case, where a group of local children have seemed to vanish in the local woods. Written by Never You Mind Who, we start off with the story Friendly Sunshine Gnomes. People always want answers, yet people are seldom ready to accept those answers. The problem is that sometimes the answers can be more disturbing than the unanswered question and sometimes they only lead to more wondering. Sometimes answers aren't all they're cracked up to be. That's what I've learned in my experience as a detective working on missing persons cases. A few weeks ago, I began work investigating a particularly disturbing case. Three young girls had reportedly gone missing in the town's nearby woods and their parents were worried sick. The disappearance was huge news in the small town. Search parties were out in full force. I was with one of the many groups of people out there scouring the woods in every direction. We knew we had to act fast if we wanted to find them alive. For several days, we found absolutely nothing and we had entered into our fifth night of looking. No one dared to say it out loud but we knew what we were looking for at this point, corpses. We knew those girls weren't going to come walking out of the woods unharmed like nothing ever happened. I kept on looking, walking through the dark woods alone, guided by my flashlight while my team looked to elsewhere in other directions. The search was an incredibly somber and isolating experience. It's a very grim, and morbid task to be searching for the remains of three lost children. It was a cold fall night, a waxing crescent moon loomed high above. The autumn leaves blanketed the muddy ground as I trudged onward. Suddenly I heard an eerie sound. It sounded like soft singing in the distance. I turned all around but saw nothing in the autumn maze of orange, yellow, and brown. In hopes that it might somehow be the young girls, I yelled out, Police, do you need help? There was no response. I sat there in silence for a moment before I continued walking. I noticed something very bizarre up ahead and went to inspect it. It was what I can only describe as an archway made of sticks and leaves. They formed an oval the size that a person could walk through. The formation appeared to be naturally occurring rather than man-made. It looked like something someone might want to stage for a wedding or a photography shoot. It was like something out of an old folklore story. What happened next is beyond comprehension. A small creature walked by me in the darkness, moving in a dancing motion as it went, and humming a peculiar tune. 
It moved into the view of my flashlight, and I could see that it appeared to resemble a very small old man with a long whitish gray beard and a maroon pointed hat. The creature casually walking along looked identical to any gnome you'd see in a generic fairy tale depiction. Seeing something so cartoonish, but yet they're right in front of me in real life, was very surreal, uncanny, and disturbing. This couldn't be happening. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I felt like I was losing my mind. I watched as the mischievous little gnome skipped along towards the wooden archway. With a laugh, he walked through and disappeared completely before my very eyes. I was shocked to be really experiencing this. My entire conception of reality was shattering. Had I somehow been drugged, I wondered. This was something beyond what tiredness could explain. I approached the mysterious arched formation and studied it closely. It was just made of sticks and leaves, nothing special. I put my arm through and held it there for a moment, nothing at first, but then it started to slowly feel a bit numb. I took it out and stared at the archway once more. The feeling soon returned to my arm. Am I actually considering this, I thought. With an abundant lack of explanations for what I just saw, I decided to risk whatever danger I might face by walking through this apparently mystical archway. Feeling a bit silly, I took a deep breath and walked carefully through the natural oval stick structure. Suddenly my mind was in a daze. It was like waking up from a dream. I looked around to see the same woods I had been standing in, but it was bright and sunny. All my senses were strangely heightened. My mind was buzzing. I looked down to see that the flashlight I was carrying had vanished. The leaves seemed brighter. The air felt nicer and all seemed calm. Where was I? I looked around and that's when the little creatures came in, appearing from behind the nearby trees. There must have been about Ten of them, the gnomes were smiling as they danced around in a circle, laughing and singing an oddly familiar song. One of the gnomes walked up to me and began to mischievously dig through my pockets. He found the change I had in there and stole a single quarter. He lifted the shiny silver coin up in the air and it reflected the sun burning brightly above. He let out a tricksterish laugh, put the quarter in his pocket, and joined back with the others in their dance. I had no idea where I was, what I was witnessing, or how to react to any of this. Suddenly, the gnomes all took off and ran further into the forest. I chased after them, running through a narrow opening in the dense section of brush. I was greeted with a disturbing new environment and the intense feeling that something was horribly wrong. I found myself standing within a large ring of trees deep in the woods. My run soon gave way to a slow and unsure walk forward. At first, what I saw looked to be a pile of yellowish off-white rocks neatly stacked up on top of each other in a row. But when I got closer, it was clear and unmistakable that these were piles of skulls. Their laughter grew louder and more sinister, and their dances became more frantic as I crept slowly forward. The taste of iron unexplainably filled my mouth. As I grew closer, I could see that the ground was covered in a dark red substance. The air became thick and humid and I began to feel very claustrophobic. Dancing faster in a circle and cackling maniacally, the gnomes were holding entrails and viscera all around them on the ground. It appeared to be the gore of dozens of unrecognizable bodies. There was so much blood 
the foul and deadly odor assaulted my nostrils and turned my stomach. I was hit with waves of panic. I felt like my mind shut down completely and I was paralyzed where I was standing. The gnomes all turned to me smiling and simply continued their dark and morbid singing. I just remember screaming and screaming and screaming as loud as I could. Then just nothing, the rest is all blank. I don't remember a thing, but according to my partner, he found me zoned out and lying on the muddy ground of the dark woods where I had been searching for the girls. I was apparently clutching my flashlight and mumbling to myself. He says I must have had some kind of psychotic episode, I'm not so sure. I would be tempted to blame it all on the stress of the job, but when I checked my pocket, a quarter was inexplicably missing. I spent the next few days looking over the case files. I had a lot of theories, but none that made sense. According to reports, the neighbor of the lost children had been looking out of her kitchen window while washing dishes. She purportedly saw the older sister leading her to younger siblings by the hand into the woods. They were humming a strange tune as they disappeared off into the wilderness that day and were never seen again. The case files also reveal that the missing girls reportedly took a book from their playroom's bookshelf before vanishing. It was a children's fairy tale book with bright, happy illustrations of gnomes dancing through the forests. It was called the Friendly Sunshine Gnomes. I can still hear their odd singing in my mind at times when I am alone. I don't think we'll ever find those girls or truly know what I experienced, and I'm convincing myself more and more each day that I really don't need the answers. In the beginning, we warned that deep parts of the forest can be home to truly terrifying things. In our second story, we find out what happens when you come across the sacred and forbidden places. Written by Samaroni One, you should beware of the entities of Klaus Wood. If you're ever in Canterbury or its surrounding areas, I suggest you stay away from Klaus Wood. It's fairly small and remarkably unexceptional compared to some of the other woodlands in the area, so most people tend to avoid. This made it the perfect place for an impromptu camping trip for me to get away from it all that's actually quite dense woodland when you get right into it giving you that feeling of utter isolation from the rest of the world. This made it the perfect spot, or so it seemed. You see, there is a reason why Clauswood has been left nearly untouched for decades. There's a reason why the local people choose to avoid it. Hell, the road leading through it hasn't been used and so long the overgrowth has claimed it. But we'll get to that later. The day had dawned, the car was packed, and the drinking had begun. Of course, as is the way with most things, the journey wasn't as smooth as one would have hoped. The road, which leads through Claus, which was actually a lot worse than I had anticipated it was in a state of complete disrepair, with weeds and brambles completely immersing it. I had to leave my car in the closest spot I could find and walk the rest of the way, which wasn't easy with the gear I had. This really was a laborious task. The forest was thick and unforgiving, leaving me scratched and bruised from my battle with the foliage. I had a small knife with me which I used to hack through the brush, but it was still a challenging task. 
I was beginning to get a bit nervous at this point. I had never been camping by myself before, especially not in the middle of the woods, but I decided now was as good a time as any to prove to myself that I could do it. That end, I had just watched 20 episodes of Bear Grylls the night before and figured, hey, if he can do it, why can't I? Still, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Klaus would is very quiet, almost silent, in fact. You'd expect to hear birds singing and local wildlife going about their day to day, but there was nothing. It seemed as if I was the only living thing in the forest. It was a hard feeling to shake, but I stayed rational and told myself to stop being stupid, so I kept going. As luck would have it, after only about an hour's walk, I managed to find a great clearing to set up in. It was probably about 30 feet in diameter and almost a perfect circle with one solitary tree off to the north, just breaking the line of other trees. There was also an interesting rock formation about 30 feet away from it. It looked like some sort of scepter. It had a large black spherical rock atop a long black cuboy. I marveled at it for a few seconds before moving on. I decided to set up camp here darkness was creeping in as was the general panic at the very thought of having to set up my tent blind, so this seemed like the best spot I could find. I'm not even sure of what time of day it was. The forest canopy is so dense not a lot of light manages to seep through. Luckily, my tent was just a pop-up which you needed to peg down, so it was set up in no time. I'll call her Lucy, I said, chuckling to myself. She was big enough to fit three men in as well. I giggled to myself for a little while, cursing the fact that there was no one around to hear my spectacular joke. I then grabbed my chair, started a fire, and got to drinking. The tent was on my left, the fire was dead ahead, the place where I, you know, relieved myself was behind me, and the thick tree line was all around. I still cannot believe how dark that night was. The darkness was suffocating, I am not sure if it was because I was nervous or what, but I felt as if I was gasping for air. I couldn't see past the fire, I could barely even see my own tent for that matter. I tried to take my mind off things by carrying on with roasting the marshmallows and listening to music, but lo and behold, my phone was dead. Have you ever experienced a silence so intense it's almost deafening? There was literally no noise anywhere. I could almost hear my insides working as I scoffed the marshmallows down, desperately trying to fight off the overwhelming panic I could sense dawning upon me. All of a sudden, the silence was broken. There was a rustling of leaves about ten feet to the right of me. Dim lights appeared around the clearing. I'm not sure if it was just my mind playing tricks on me or if it was just ambience from the fire. I can't even begin to imagine how much I must have looked like a deer in the headlights at that moment. My head turn faster than a bullet leaves a gun. Seriously, I should have sprained my neck or something from that because it was inhuman how fast I turned. I was straining my eyes and craning my neck, desperately trying to identify the cause of the nose. When I saw it, it was only because it moved again that I noticed it. Had it stayed still, I would have missed it forever. There was a tiny little bunny rabbit on the floor, hopping around without a care in the world. I breathed a sigh of relief, cleaned the metaphorical shit from my pants, and chuckled to myself about being such a coward. I didn't sleep at all that night. It was too dark to quiet, you know. 
I felt I don't know watched. It's hard to explain. I felt as if at any moment someone or something would come crashing through Lucy's flap to ambush me. But nothing came. My hand didn't leave the knife I'd placed under my pillow for one second. I was ashamed. I felt like I had let myself down. Like a frightened child calling out to his parents in the night, I felt that I had to talk to someone. Get out of my own head. I summoned all of my courage and decided to stay another night to get over my childlike fear of the dark. So that's exactly what I did. It's a good thing I was already on my way to my makeshift toilet because what I saw when leaving my tent that morning would have caused my bowels to evacuate faster and a house on fire. The rabbit, which was so merrily hopping around my tent that previous night was dead. Cut in half, in fact, and left at the base of the isolated tree. I couldn't look at it for too long. It was making me feel ill. How could I have not heard it? It didn't make any sense. How could I have heard it hopping around, but not getting sliced apart? Whatever it did, it must have been bigger than the rabbit so surely it would have made more noise. I assumed it was some sort of bird nesting in the tree that killed it, and it must have fallen. That's really the only plausible explanation. I decided to kill time by having a look around the surrounding area. Like I said, I had never been camping before on my own, so I had no idea how to pass the time. So I decided to go for a quick exploration. And what do you think I saw? You guessed it, more trees. There were a few interesting things though. For example, I had only walked about 30 feet or so before I stumbled upon a large, perfectly spherical black rock. It was about the size of your average football, nesting itself atop another larger rock. This other rock was similar to the first. It was black and smooth, but it resembled more of a cuboid than a sphere. A strange feeling washed over me. Had I got myself lost? This was an extremely similar formation to the one I had seen yesterday, but I had gone the opposite way from my camp. I ran back through the brush to where I assumed the other formation was. Luckily, I found it. I let out a sigh of relief, realizing I hadn't gone completely insane. I was intrigued now, though. I started wandering around the edge of the clearing looking for more of these formations. I managed to find two more. There was one to the north of the camp, one to the east, one to the south, and one to the west. I'll admit I should have been more wary but I thought nothing of it and moved on. Besides, the darkness was creeping in again, so I wanted to get back to camp, back to safety. Darkness had well and truly come. It was awful. I wanted to leave, get back to my home, but I'd never find my way. The darkness had literally enveloped my camp. It was heavy, thick, suffocating. The silence was back as well. Something was different about tonight, though. It was hard to put my finger on it. I had this overwhelming sense of dread. The fire was much smaller than last night as well, so I felt even more blind. The feeling of helplessness was getting to me, and panic was starting to take hold, so I decided to have a little look around and see if there was anything interesting. You know, I've never seen an owl before, so I was scanning the trees, seeing if anything at all caught my attention. As I was scanning the tree line, something caught my attention. There was a dim light coming from the edge of the clearing, roughly about 30 feet away from me. My peripheral vision just about managed to pick it up. I strained my neck to see what it was. 
but unfortunately is sunk back into the darkness. I hoped for some reason that it would be another person. My naivety was getting to me, another speck of light appeared. I could only see it in my peripheral vision as I turned my head, but it was roughly 90 degrees away from where the first one was. Again, I turned to look, but I couldn't see it anymore. Wild thoughts started running through my head at this point. Who were these people? What were they doing here? What did they want from me? I even began to wonder if it was the rock formations that were somehow emitting light, but I dismissed it. I had another scan of the tree line and my heart stopped. Something had caught my eye. It was hard to make out exactly what it was, what I thought I'd seen, since I only caught it for a brief moment. There was a silhouette of a person peering out from behind the tree, the lone tree which I had chosen to camp with. As soon as I looked at it, it disappeared. Sneaking back behind the tree, I leapt out of my chair. My heart was racing, my limbs felt like jelly. Jesus, I was a mess. I felt all the blood rush out of my head. I decided the best thing to do was to turn back to my tent and try to get some sleep. I turned towards the tent and nearly blacked out. There was another one peering out at me from behind my tent. Again, I only caught it for a brief second but it was much closer than the last one. I couldn't make out any features. It was just a black, humanoid mass. This thing was dark, darker than anything I had ever seen before. It seemed to emanate hatred and anger, in the same way that at that time I must have been emanating fear. I ran into my tent, pulled the sleeping bag over my head, and tried to sleep. Sunlight was burning my unopened eyes. I opened them dazed, confused, delirious. It took me a few seconds to remember where I was, but my surroundings were off. I wasn't lying down. I was leaning against something. It took me a moment, but I eventually realized what was wrong. I was still in my sleeping bag, but I wasn't in my tent. Frightened, I looked around. My heart felt like it was about to explode. It was beating so fast. My tent was dead ahead of me. The flap was ripped open, and some of my stuff was strewn around the clearing. It finally dawned on me. I realized where I had woken up. I turned my head upwards towards the sky and confirmed my fears. I was sitting at the base of the tree. I sprung to my feet. I was blind with terror at this point. There, sticking out of the tree, was my knife. Carved into the tree was one word, leave. And that's exactly what I did. Many folks have pleasant childhood memories of growing up near a forest, whether it was a childhood home or a beloved family vacation spot. But nostalgia can be dangerous and can mask hidden danger behind such pleasant memories. In the story written by William C., you should be careful around the wriggling trees. When I was a kid, we had these unreachable, giant pine trees sitting down a long embankment behind my house. I say they were unreachable only because my parents would repeatedly warn me not to approach a hill to get a closer look. It's not like it was a particularly steep hill looking back, but to my child sensibilities, there was still an element of danger to the approach, especially because mom and dad told me no without much elaboration. 
Obviously, I could have been seriously hurt if I lost my footing, but I rarely had any reason to visit that area unless I was taking the trash out to the small gravel path where we kept our garbage bins. There's a rather unpleasant association I have with that old place now. I've since moved out, being in my 30s. But every now and then I try to run my brain back to that age where things seemed just off. You know what I mean. That thing where as a kid, you're dead certain about the little things coinciding with each other. But because it was so long ago, there's no way to empirically prove it. There were a lot of little things that contributed to that unpleasantness, but the primary element was the trees. I don't have any specific memories from that house by now, but I do remember the pines. I remember looking at them from my bedroom window at night, elevated just slightly above ground floor, so I was more so on a second floor. I could see down the embankment so that the forest below was just barely able to peek out. I'd see the trees swaying in the night breeze, black giants contrasting against a dark blue sky. I'd fixate onto specific trees, ones that were slightly shorter than the rest of their siblings. Maybe it was my kid brain overthinking. Maybe it was the effect of staring for too long at shadows with nebulous outlines. But in my mind's eye, I could see them swaying in the opposite directions of the other trees, often asynchronously. Sometimes they'd stand completely still even during turbulent storms. It didn't make much sense to me, but in a small way, my kid mind rationalized it as myself simply not understanding all the complexities of wine physics and nature working in tandem but the excuses of not understanding would rapidly give way to doubt. After all, if I didn't understand why they do what they do, would that not justify my delusion? And in my head, for some insane reason, I felt like they were watching me as they danced sleepily. In the same way a kid peeks out from barely open crescent eyes to fool their parents, but in a patently obvious way that might make the parents aware the kid was awake. Almost like an inside joke, I suppose. They were watching me. They were pretending to not be alive, to simply be trees in the only way a tree can be. But they knew I was watching. And that's why they danced the way they did when it was only me awake at 10 p.m., a time I should have been long asleep by. In my perception, they could only know I was awake if they saw me open the blinders, so I'd push my iris as closely as possible to the tiny little gap where the blinder string pushed through, so that there was no perceivable way for them to know I was watching them back. But perception is in itself a curse of sorts. All you have to do is be aware of something for it be in your radius of knowledge. And in that sense, it becomes aware of you in return. It only went downhill after my blinders became damaged from my repeated and more frantically curious observations. Due to my bending them to look out the window, either of watching my dad come home from work or the former nighttime ritual. One blinder eventually bent far enough it snapped off. So now my window had, in itself, a doorway for the unsettling trees to progress into my room and my mind. And once this came to pass, more and more strange things began to occur both inside the house and around the property. One event involved my study of the grass leading up the hill where the trash cans lay. I noticed swirling patterns that prior had not been there, a sort of snaking motion that led away from the forest below. It was so obvious a change it was impossible not to notice, but still 
I had no way to confirm since I had no way to compare the prior texture, no evidence, no proof. The trees continued their motions even on spring days where the world desired to stand still with eyes closed to the sun. A certain dampness began to settle into the foundations of my home. Another small thing to overlook as a child due to my parents motioning to not concern myself. But nights spent listening through the walls informed me that the house's stability was becoming an issue. The ground beneath was apparently built on less than stable material when we'd first moved in, and now years later, we were beginning to see a very gradual but inevitable shift towards the hillside we would have to move out within a year or two. Another night, something awful clawed its way out of my imagination. Our house was small, more of a two with three sections. The living room where the entrance lay, a kitchen with some space for the table, a hallway with stairs leading to the basement, and then my room at the very end. My bed was positioned in such a way that I could basically look all the way down to the living room. Oftentimes, with the door open for some bizarre reason I'll never understand. Ambient lighting from outside was minimal in the area he lived in. So as a result, the living room was often pitch black past the portal. And I would stare into this area sometimes remembering what my mom told me about staring at something too long without thinking, idle eyes, and all that. Many times I'd begin to see movement, the silhouette of a man silently making his way towards me as I lay there paralyzed until closing my eyes. Of course, he never got any closer, but I could very well see his bulky figure assuredly stepping through the portal to reach my room. My being aware of him was enough to bring him to life, but this one night was different. I heard the house creaking and settling in the breeze of the landscape. Something was worming its way in. And again, I watched and waited for the shadow man to make his approach. He took a lot longer to appear this time and when he did, the stress of my recent overthinking began to stretch the apparition to its logical extremes. He was misshapen this time, lopsided like the fist of a god pressed him into a clay putty nonsense shape. Instead of the obviously shimmering, hallucinatory outline I'd become familiar with, he was lined with squirming, wriggling lines, black enough to have no discernible details, but material enough to display the sheen of some shiny, hairy, perhaps viscous material. It watched me for what fell, like eons that night before stumbling out of view. I saw his bulbous head peek back into the door frame for a second, showing some tenuous understanding of the mutual observation that was taking place. And as my heart froze into a block of ice, the shadow men melted into little black forms and scurried into the darkness. After we moved out prematurely due to a prominent black mold issue, the years passed in a faded blur. As with all childhood nightmares, the details I felt were real enough to ask my parents about were dismissed with notions of old that didn't happen, or you probably just imagined it. You always had an active mind, kiddo. It would have to suffice until recently, after memories of the incident drove my curiosity to its breaking point. As an adult, you have the power to strip your nightmares bare, and as an accomplished writer, I desire to form some inspiration for future works. I found the old address and drove out to it one afternoon. The ambiguously rural cul-de-sac was still there, and tainted by time or the pale blue noon sun, still green and luscious as the day we left. 
and unsurprisingly, the house was gone. The foundation had long since been paved over with cement and overgrown with various weeds and sticker brush. It was amazing seeing just how tiny that little shithole was, but I was also grateful we'd had it at all. Feeling myself tense up, I crept towards the fabled hill I'd never before had access to. By my own authority, I strode to the edge and gazed across the forest top and trailed my way down to where those two trees once stood. It defies all logic what I saw down there. The way I'd heard my parents describing the structural decay definitely implied that the house would be a crumpled mess by the time we left. Even a child could be sure of it. And yet, down where the nightmare trees of my childhood stood waving in anticipation for my return, there was my house. Nestled between them, like some strange face resting chin down at the tree line entrance. It looked pretty much the same disposition downward at about 30 to 40 meters on the incline which was not as steep as I remembered, so that I could see a bit of the roof as well. In fact, I was acutely aware just how close the trees were and I felt my gut sink. The hollow windows blinked back at me. I stood there for ages as a gentle breeze began to settle in, feeling a lot like how I felt during those sleepless nights when the shadow man tried creeping into my room. Except this time when I closed my eyes, it didn't go away. The house, the trees, the strangely snaking grass bath, it was all still there and very real. And even worse, as I stared out into the word no that lay at the bottom of the hill, I realized that much of it stood out in startling contrast to its surroundings. The trees, my house, and even a patch of the sky behind the tree line were somehow more saturated, more fuzzy than the objects and space adjacent. I can't describe it well enough, it was like someone had painted a blurry image of that scene over my own vision, long where I was looking. I bobbed my head frantically, trying to discern what exactly was the change taking place. I stepped down the hill, pinching closer to the playfully teasing trees, and then my house began to wave back, shimmying like a tree. The clouds in the sky above the tree line squirm in place, their white puffs turning inward into centipedal spirals. And as I inspected closer and closer, it was with dawning horror that I recognized the shape of the thing I was looking at in my fragmented understanding of reality. The trees, the house, the ground, and even the sky were all made with that same wriggling, teasing, malignant shape the shadow man had turned into that one night ages ago. Like an infection, a growth, it had spread to its surroundings in a two-dimensional facsimile of the area I'd grown to know. Maybe it was my perception that fed it, or maybe it had been feeding on something else. Maybe we had escaped just in time. As I came within 10 feet, a gut-churning distance doing what I know now, I tried to peek past the tree line, desperate to dispel my feverish delusions with one last feeble attempt. Beyond the spot where the visual aberration ended was a wall of writhing parasites extending into the forest some unknown distance back, black, vile little creatures that change color the closer to the vantage point perspective they came. They perfectly mimicked every point of color, every leafy detail, every brick and every panel of the house, even the flat blue color of the sky and the white of the clouds many meters high. This whole location was just a giant parasitic mimic with the two original trees as the focal point. 
They knew I was there, and that's why they stood waiting and watching for as long as they did. They waited for me to come back so that I could continue feeding them with attention. I left not too long after. My stomach tied into knots as I avoid the rearview mirror, even now in the safety of my apartment. I never tend to stare for very long at any given spot for too long. No moving shadows hold my attention. No ambiguous shapes on the horizon give me intrigue. All I desire is to quell the worming sensation that occasionally erupts from my brain, lest it grow into a writhing alien that consumes my vision and dreams. For our final story tonight, we look into the hobby of hiking. Hiking in the woods can be a very relaxing pastime, having the time to take a close connection with nature. But doing so by yourself can be very dangerous. Having a personal moment of connection with the forest can be spiritual. You might not be as alone as you'd like. Written by Brian Berta, we present a hike in the woods. I went hiking near my house in a medium-sized wooded area in northern Wyoming. I decided to walk a few miles to get exercise and then I'd come home. Upon driving up to the woods where I would take my hike, I noticed that for other cars were parked on the edge of the thick gravel beside the trail leading into the semi-darkness of the wilderness. After putting a water bottle and a couple energy bars into my pocket. I began my hike into the forest. Right when I showed up, there was a bridge that I had to walk over first. Below was a small river about 50 feet below me. I walked across the bridge and started to walk through the trail. After walking for 15 minutes, I had a weird thought that someone was behind me. When I looked behind me, I was surprised to see a man in a black hoodie staring at me from about 10 feet away. He was dressed in all black. As soon as he saw me, he turned away and ran into the trees before I could get a good look at his face. I figured that he was just some dumbass joking around with me. After yelling for him to quit it, I continued walking hoping he would leave me alone. However, I saw him again from 15 feet off of the trail staring at me. Because he was so far away, I couldn't see his face. He was standing there motionless looking at me. It appeared that he was trying to scare me. I called out to him and said, I don't know if you think that this is some kind of joke, but I'm not laughing, so get lost. The guy didn't move and he just stood still. I tried again and said to him, I'm not kidding, you're not funny, now knock it off. He then walked away so I continued walking. A couple minutes later, he came out of nowhere, shoved me down and ran back into the woods. There was no way that I would let him shove me down and get away with it so I started chasing after him to scare him away. I ran off of the trail and into the woods. He was slowly getting away from me at a steady pace. After running for a couple minutes, I started to grow tired. I stopped to catch my breath and decided just to let him go. After catching my breath, I decided to head back towards the trail. However, I saw him again. He was standing in the middle of two large trees, staring at me, so I started chasing after him again. This time, I was going much faster, and I had a greater intention to catch him. After running for a few more minutes, I started to grow tired again. I was still running after him, 
but much slower since I was nearly out of breath. I gave up a second time and I fell to my knees to catch my breath. Once again, I decided to go back and hope that he would finally leave me alone. However, after running for five minutes away from the trail, I wasn't sure how to get back to it. I tried running in the opposite direction to see if I would make it back. After a few short breaks, I realized that I was running the wrong way, so I tried going left. I ran for several minutes in that direction, and I realized that I went the wrong way again. I looked around to see if I could find anything which looked familiar, but I couldn't see anything. I then saw the same man staring at me again standing on top of a hill. I was furious at this point and I started chasing him again. I was pretty sure that this was the fastest I've ever ran before in my life. I wanted to catch up to him and beat the living shit out of him for shoving me down and getting me lost here. I then stopped running though because I realized that I needed to get back before I got myself more lost. Maybe he was trying to lead me further into the woods for some sort of a sick prank. I had to focus on getting back to the trail. I turned around and started walking back. After a minute or so, I felt a twig hit me on the back. I turned around and I saw him standing directly behind me. Since he was directly behind me, I figured that he wouldn't be able to get away from me again, so I began chasing him again. We ran at about the same speed. I wasn't any further than a few feet behind him. He was slowly starting to outrun me. I tried my very best to keep up with him. I was using all of my power to run as fast as possible. Nothing was more important to me than catching up to him. I started to catch up to him for a brief second, but he looked back for a split second and picked up his pace, so he started to outrun me yet again. I started to grow tired, but I wouldn't stop. I was running so fast at this point that I thought my heart would give out. I started catching up to him again. I was just about to grab him, but all of a sudden, I tripped over a rock and I fell flat on my face. The fall knocked the wind out of me. I was in a lot of pain and I was out of breath. I struggled to breathe and since I was already tired out from all that running I did. To catch my breath again, I leaned up against a tree. I got up to my feet and I felt slightly dizzy. After taking a few drinks of water to catch my breath again, I eventually felt better. I was very pissed at that guy, and I wanted to beat the shit out of him more than everything else. I forgot what direction I came from though. After looking around for a bit, I picked a random direction which I thought was the right way, and I was going to keep on going that way until I made it back to any trail. Fifteen minutes of walking later, I finally found a trail and I was happy to see it. When I set foot on it, I decided to go left and continue walking. After I turned the corner, though, it led me to a dead end. I turned around and assumed that the next direction I took would get me out of here. I walked past the turn and I walked past the place I entered the trail at. I walked in that direction and was met with yet another dead end. I was very upset at this point because this small section of the trail that I found was pretty much useless since it didn't connect to any other trails and it was just a dead end. I cursed at my luck and I cursed at the man in black who got me stuck here. After picking up a thin, long stick from the woods, I decided to mark up each dead end to remember the different ways this trail led to. 
I took the small stick and etched a number one into the first dead end I found, a number two in the other dead end I found, and a number three in the area I entered this trail at. I was pacing back and forth trying to figure out what to do next. When I reached one dead end though, the number one I put in was gone and it was replaced with there is no escape. I froze because I realized that the man in black must have written this seconds ago. After looking up, I saw him running away. I swore at him and threw the twig at him and it landed in the middle of the woods. I wasn't going to chase him though because I knew that he was probably trying to get me even more lost. However, I knew that staying here wouldn't help me find the exit. The trail looked very old, since there were plants and tree roots growing into it. I was certain that no one set foot in here for at least several years. I had to pick a way to go and hope that it would be the right way. I then thought of an idea. The man wrote the phrase where I wrote the number one into the dirt. Clearly, he was trying to get me to follow him that way. That must have meant that he didn't want me to go the other way. I had to follow the other dead end where I wrote the number two into the dirt. I went back to that spot and I ran that way as fast as I could. I was very proud of myself for figuring that out. Running in that direction, I tried to make as little noise as possible because maybe he didn't notice that I came this way. After going that way for several minutes, I found another trail. At first, it didn't seem familiar at all to me. After about 10 minutes, though, it started to feel more familiar to me. I ran in a random direction and I realized that I was getting close to the exit. The trees were looking more familiar to me. I expected that the guy would try to make one final attempt to stop me, but he was nowhere to be found. Upon approaching the old creaking bridge I walked across to get here, I ran across it. When I was in the middle of it though, I saw the man standing in the way of the exit blocking my path. There was no way that I would let him stop me now considering how close I got to escaping. Unless he moved out of the way, I was going to fight him. However, I wasn't just about to let him walk away with a few bruises and cuts. I was going to beat him within an inch of his life if I had to. I darted at him, and he darted at me. I jumped at him with all my might ready to fight him. Immediately, we grabbed each other. We paused for a split second, and I punched him on the side of his face. He pushed me back a bit, and I tripped and fell down. He pinned me down and began choking me. I tried scratching him and punching him, but he wouldn't stop. I started growing dizzy and I knew that I was going to die if I didn't get him to stop. Looking to my left, I saw a big rock resting on the bridge. I reached out to grab it only to find that it was just out of my reach. I tried as hard as I could to grab it. I eventually got it and I hit him on the side of his head with it. He fell down right beside me. I took a deep breath, and I got up, and hit him a second time with the rock. I then proceeded to hit him several times with it. Some of his blood started spilling out of his head, and I took a deep breath and stopped. I got up, and I stared at him. He was crawling around in great pain. This time, I got a better look at what he looked like. He was wearing a black hoodie and a black pair of pants. He had several scars on his hands and lower legs. Because he was wearing a hoodie and long pants, I was unsure whether his entire body was full of those scars. It was clear that he must have cut himself a lot. I prepared to hit him again with the rock. I lifted it up 
and I swung it down towards his bloody head with all my might. However, before I could finish him off, the people grabbed me from behind. I tried kicking them to get them to drop me, but it wasn't working at all. I was unable to do anything. They were dragging me back into the woods. They then turned me around and I saw at least 20 of the people in black walking towards me. I was shocked. I thought that the guy I beat up was the only one who was chasing me, but there were dozens of them who were following me along the path all day. One of them pulled a syringe out of his pocket and he was walking towards me. I tried kicking at him to get him away. A few more of them held my feet and body down so I couldn't move at all. They pinned me to the ground. The man with the syringe was right above me. There was dark, black liquid inside it. I tried screaming for help as a last resort. The man then injected the liquid into my arm. I tried screaming again. It made me grow dizzy very fast. Soon after, I was starting to see nothing but blur. I tried my hardest to stay awake. However, my attempts didn't work and I eventually grew weaker and weaker until I passed out. And so as we reach the end of summer, we also reach the end of this episode. But as something ends, something begins. And we begin our start with Halloween season, starting on this coming Friday, September the 13th. We will present you all 13 stories of Halloween on our main YouTube channel. We look forward to sharing these stories with you. Sleep well, if you can, for the night holds secrets that even your nightmares dare not reveal. <laughs>